My name is Marcia Angel. I'm senior lecturer in social medicine at Harvard Medical School. I joined the editorial staff of the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979, rose through the ranks, became executive editor in 1988, and then editor-in-chief in 1999, uh, and served in that capacity for a year, stepped down in June of 2000. I was at the journal for 21 years. So it would be very hard for me to select particular uh, scientific contributions that changed everything overnight, although I'm sure there were some. As just one example of getting what it pays for, look at the Medicare drug benefit. In 2003, Congress passed a Medicare prescription drug benefit that would partially subsidize prescription drugs for seniors. It contained an extraordinary provision. Medicare, in that bill, was expressly prohibited from using its purchasing power to negotiate prices or to set up formularies of the best drugs. It had to pay, said the bill, whatever the companies or the private middlemen chose to charge. The person most responsible for pushing this peculiar bill through Congress was Representative Billy Towson, chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Shortly after its passage, he retired from Congress and shortly after that was rewarded by being named CEO of Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Industries Trade Association, at a salary of $2 million a year. When Barack Obama was running for president, he expressed outrage over this deal and promised to try to overturn the provision that prevented Medicare from negotiating drug prices. But now look what's happened. All talk of overturning that provision has stopped. And recently, it was revealed that the president and his new friend, Billy Towson, had reached a deal of their own. Several analyses have shown that the innovative research was not done in the companies that sell the drugs, the early discoveries, but in NIH-funded laboratories, mainly in universities and at the NIH itself. The drug companies license many of their drugs from universities or from startup biotech companies. The NIH, uh, publicly funded research, gives rise to the early discoveries, and then at some point in the development process, it's handed off to the drug companies, uh, they license it in, and they continue the development. They pay for the clinical trials, which they certainly do, uh, and then they manufacture the drugs and distribute the drugs. So what's wrong with that sequence of events? Well, the problem is that these companies expect to be rewarded as though they were the source of innovation, and they're not. And we get to pay twice. Uh, the, the research is taxpayer finance, the NIH is, is publicly funded, and then we get to pay at the drugstore. We know that the pharmaceutical industry has the largest lobby in Washington. They give generously to political campaigns. So on the left here, we can see that that's probably a part that comes out of their marketing budget, political contributions, front groups patient advocacy groups, uh, political policy groups. They set up a lot of what, what's called astroturf groups. Uh, these are, these are uh, groups that are supposed to look like grassroots organizations, but they're really front groups for the industry. Uh, they uh, give gifts to institutions and community and cultural organizations. If you look at the donors to Harvard Medical School, for example, in the Dean's Report of Gifts to Harvard Medical School, you find right up in the top few donors some of the major pharmaceutical companies. But that's a lot of money, but it's not $55 billion. 
Where does the 55 billion go? Well, I think it goes mainly here, into the education of doctors. Drug companies pay for most continuing medical education, which doctors have to get in order to uh, keep their licenses, their state licenses. They pay for most of that. They sponsor most of the big professional societies. They subsidize their meetings. They pay for other medical conferences, educational materials, gifts, meals, junkets. No doctor has to pay for any of his own meals if he doesn't want to. Uh, in fact, everywhere two doctors are gathered together, so too is the pharmaceutical industry.